Hello, everybody. I'm Cindy Braden. I'm the SVP of Sales for Enzo Data, and I want to thank you for spending some time with us to join us for the webinar. Let me introduce our two presenters, William Hevener and Chris Fernandez. William is an RPSGT, the Clinical Initiatives Manager at Better Night. William has been involved in sleep medicine since 2003 and is passionate about sleep disordered breathing education. He joined the Better Night team in 2013 and is proud to have implemented strategies that drive improved therapy compliance and patient care with the power of AI. My fearless leader, Chris Fernandez, is the co-founder and CEO at Exodata. He has a master's degree in biomedical engineering at UW-Madison and more than seven years of machine learning and AI research experience. He now leads our Enzo Data team with a mission to simplify the process for analyzing the human body to accurately diagnose health conditions and thereby increase access of quality health care to everyone everywhere. With that, I will hand it over to Chris. So thank you everyone uh, for, for joining our webinar. I'm very excited to, to share this with you today. Uh, the topic for today is using AI to predict future CPAP adherence and the impact of behavioral and technical interventions. Uh, your speakers today, as Cindy mentioned, will be uh, William and myself. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with the fantastic team at Better Night and our team here at, at Enzo Data. So AI is changing sleep medicine. And through peer-reviewed research and commercial products, the foundation has been laid that demonstrates AI is also transforming CPAP therapy. There are numerous examples of this. And some of the areas that we are the most excited about are opportunities for AI to help with selecting treatments, such as optimizing mask fittings and geometry for oral appliances, to optimizing the effectiveness of those treatments for new patients with titration pressures and ventilatory settings, optimizing their outcomes long-term as patients' health evolves, including ongoing remote pressure monitoring and modulation over time, to optimizing the therapeutic experience, uh, the long-term outcomes, compliance, and patient experience on therapy, which is the major focus of this work. Let's dive into this section. So uh, outside of sleep medicine, AI has been adopted in nearly all of the largest technology companies to solve some of the most surprisingly human problems and opportunities that AI has tackled so far. Examples include Netflix, who is using AI to customize and personalize user experiences to understand what genres and individual movies uh, you might like the most, and has also gotten into the content production business, uh, feeling that they understand their user preferences so well that they're investing $14 billion a year in original content production in Hollywood. At Spotify, understanding the context for music, whether you're listening to music to energize yourself, to relax, and to tailor the playlists, to really align with your preferences. One of their secrets is the uh, shuffle functionality is not really random. At the New Yorker, uh, where you know, our own team collaborated uh, with the folks there to help to build AI that understands comedy, uh, to help power their comedy caption contest, for which they were getting more than 10,000 funny submissions a month, and it became too big of a problem for humans to solve. And even the BBC, the world news, the editorial content, the ads, and even the layout that they show you when, they, when you access their services. Why do these companies use AI to customize these user experiences? It's pretty simple. Uh, doing effective personalization increases usage of these services. It improves satisfaction of the folks accessing these services. It allows them to enhance and to tailor their customer experience and ultimately to create value. You can probably see where I'm going with this, but there are clear parallels with our objectives in engaging patients on CPAP therapy and in their long-term care. The rest of this talk focuses on the application of AI to the problem of CPAP adherence, and specifically how we can use AI to elucidate these surprisingly human characteristics from CPAP data directly, and do that in a way that creates a significant opportunity to improve usage and outcomes. I'll now pass the mic to Billy to walk us through this groundbreaking work on what is, to the best of our knowledge, the largest ever CPAP data set analyzed for this AI application to date. Hi, thank you, Chris. So 
why would we want to apply artificial intelligence to CPAP adherence? The primary reason is because adherence to CPAP, which is still considered the gold standard for treatment of OSA, is very difficult to achieve. In this study, uh, trends, trends in CPAP adherence, they looked at 20 years of data. They saw a non-adherence rate of 34.1%. While they stated that behavioral intervention did add about an hour on average to a patient's nightly use, the study did not show an increase in adherence expected given today's technology and the coaching and engagement uh, we practiced. Much of this is due to the cost of building follow-up programs, buying or building software programs to maintain them, and finally staffing those programs. And who are the staff? Are they clinicians? Are they administrative? Do they specialize in sleep? How do they help the process? How do they actually impact the patient? So when you look at CPAP adaptation and management, it helps to look at it as a behavior change. If we apply the trans-theoretical model of behavior change to it, then the patients have about have five stages that they basically live in. So in the pre-contemplation phase, they don't intend to act on anything. They haven't even really considered it. And this is where kind of awareness is being created. In the contemplation phase, they realize that there is in fact an issue. They start to prepare and build momentum to mentally take on the behavior change necessary. This is kind of where the motivation or where you build that motivation. Um, in the determination phase, they actually take steps towards the behavior change, putting it into motion. This is where education and, and those things begin. In the action phase, the new behavior is occurring. They've already changed their behavior and they intend to keep it going forward. Um, this is where they facilitate that action. And in the maintenance phase, they have a sustained new behavior that they intend to maintain and they just want to reinforce the change but regardless of their intentions or their plans these patients can and will slip and when they do they can slide or jump if you would back to any one of these stages it seems reasonable to assume that the further back they exist inside of this model the harder it is to bring them back to the maintenance stage of the model this means overall lower adherence outcomes, as well as increased costs for follow-up programs. Ideally, we would reach all patients as soon as a relapse in stages to this model occur, and before they're allowed to relapse any further. Early intervention and relapse for disease management is a, is a constantly advancing thing. Technology is really helping that advance, but we see a lot of room for improvement here across all disease management, and this is especially true in sleep where we have access to live modems that have been coming to us from patients' uh, nightstands for over 10 years. We've been using that data to increase compliance and to, to look at it for research. Um, in 2008, Dr. Aloya was able to successfully identify usage patterns and classify them into phenotypes in the time series analysis of treatment adherence patterns in individuals with OSA. This was a great work and he identified these seven phenotypes and it left me wondering about the behaviors that exist inside of these unique phenotypes. How can we advance these phenotypes from um, less medically beneficial uh, usage patterns to more medical benefit patterns? How do we make that change in them? How much does that change costs? What type of intervention uh, would bring about that change in which phenotypes? So what we wanted to do was find a way to intervene even earlier and go from a reactive intervention to a proactive intervention. I believe that the earlier the intervention um, will lead to higher adherence outcomes as well as increased staff efficiency and the capability to manage larger populations for longer periods of time. So what we did with this study was we took 14,000 patients, a cross-sectional cohort of 3,600 patients. We had usage data of 455 on all patients, a patient outreach notes and resupply data, as well as the 90-day compliance label, yes or no. First, what we did to examine the data was we took the previous 30 days 
and we stacked it from the largest usage to the least amount of usage. And then we broke it into three 10 day groupings. A is for 10 days that average over four hours. B is for 10 days that average less than four hours. And C represents 10 days that average or are basically zero hours of usage. So this gives us 10 rating combinations that start at the top with AAA representing 100% roughly 100% adherence, while ABC represents roughly 33% adherence and 66% usage all the way down to CCC, which would represent roughly uh, zero usage or adherence. Um, next, what we did was we grouped those into four phenotypes. We took the AAA and AAB and we put them into good users. These are users who are doing well and do not need assistance. Um, the next four combination ratings we put into the variable user category. These users use the device, but they can swing from day to day. And the, at the bottom of that combination rating, they, they need intervention. Occasional users are having very little success using the device, but they are trying and need intervention, while non-users have little to no effort or use and no success to speak of and potentially need alternative therapies and uh, redirection to their physicians. So, we took that data and we, we used an AI model called the recurrent neural networks. Now, what these do is they use the past to predict the future. So uh, take a, a sentence like to be or not to, and the system automatically assumes the word be because that's what it learned last time the word to showed up. It would do the same thing in this example. It, it, it sees 20 days out of 30, 10 days out of 30, five days out of 30. It's going to assume two days out of 30. Now, here's the unique part. If the system gets its, it, its prediction wrong, it's going to take and learn from that prediction. So when you take 14,000 patients with 455 days, each new day brings about a new prediction for the 30 days in advance, which is either true or false, which brings about an opportunity to learn. So the system, in effect, has had more chances to make correct and uh, positive and negative predictions and learn from them than any human could in any uh, career time frame. So to, to let the AI, to do the AI more justice, I'm going to let Chris jump in and really explain how and what it's doing. Thank you, Billy. So uh, to take a peek under the hood, uh, we'd like to you know share some insights into the framework for this, uh, the AI using this work. Uh, to give some insight into why it works so well. Uh, so for the input data, we feed input data into the AI model. The input data includes 30 or more days of CPAP usage data. The AI model reads that data and produces a prediction that's based on that historical data. There are two predictions that the AI model produces. One is a regression value that produces how many hours next month does the AI model think the patient will use their CPAP device? The other prediction is a classification, which one of the four phenotype categories that we've identified in this work will the patient belong to next month? Given that uh, we have an archived collection of historical data for this work, we're able to compare the AI predictions to the true number of hours next month and the true phenotype group next month, thereby calculating an error. How many hours was the AI model off? Did the AI model assign the patient into the wrong category? And by feeding these errors back into the AI model and iteratively uh, running this simulation millions of times, we're able to achieve breakthrough accuracy in that forecasting problem. So this visualizes the specific framework that we've utilized in this study, uh, including the 30 or more uh, days of CPAP usage data at the input layer, three different usage levels we've quantized usage into, number of days above four hours, below four hours, and zero hours respectively. The three-letter rating system that Billy walked us through, which assigns patients into one of four possible phenotype groups and ultimately uh, analyzes those groups relative to 20, more than 20 different behavioral outreach, troubleshooting and technical intervention options. 
Uh, so to, step, uh, to analyze the performance of our algorithm uh, for these different tasks related to CPAP therapy, uh, we utilized three different statistical analyses. Uh, first was a classification analysis for the phenotype predictions. Uh, to try to uh, provide some insight into exactly what these calculations are, uh, we'll walk through an example as we go. Uh, so let's take the good user group as an example. Sensitivity tells us for the folks that are truly in the good user category next month, how many of those patients did the algorithm correctly identify as being good users? Specificity tells us for all for patients in the three other groups that are not good users, uh, that are all more challenged than our good users, how many of those patients did we correctly identify as not being in that good user group? Accuracy combines the concepts of sensitivity and specificity to give us an overall sense of performance uh, for those positive and for those negative cases in each group. And Cohn's Kappa uh, is similar to accuracy, but a more conservative statistical estimate in the sense that it takes into account the chance that the AI algorithm might have got it right uh, by, by chance instead of by uh, having learned something meaningful. The second analysis that we did uh, is the usage days pr prediction. Given that the algorithm outputs a number of days, uh, we utilized a regression analysis uh, for, this, for this endpoint. The statistic we focused on was an R squared value, uh, which is a statistic to measure the strength of the fit of our algorithm uh, for matching the number of days the patient will use it next month. Um, and that statistic is based on something called the residual sum of squared errors. What that means is, we take the difference in the number of days the algorithm was wrong, and we sum those up over time. So this effectively represents how many, something close to how many days off or how close was it in that sense. Uh, the last and third analysis we did was a resupply uh, intervention analysis. We had more than 20 different types of behavioral and technical uh, resupply. In this work, we uh, uh, outreach options. In this work, we really focused in on resupply, and we utilized an effect size analysis to measure the strength of the effect, the statistical significance, and the average increase in monthly usage of the most effective interventions. So just to prime us with one more thing before we take a look at the very exciting results, uh, here are some example R-squared uh, results. Um, if the algorithm was perfect and it knew exactly how many days next month the patient was going to use their CPAP, uh, we would see the results manifest with an R squared value of 1.0 and all of the data points would sit on a diagonal line because there would be no residual sum of squared errors. The algorithm would get that exactly correct. In contrast, all the way on the right, um, you know, data that, that is, does not have a strong fit uh, with a given model tends to look more square or more circular. And it shows that the model uh, in, that, in those scenarios can not explain very much of the variance uh, that contributes to, to that data. So let's see how we did. Uh, the next three slides follow the same visual format. The, graph, the graphs on the left uh, show a comparison of the past 30 days to the next 30 days based on the y-axis and the x-axis respectively. The graphs on the right show a comparison between uh, the algorithm's prediction for the next 30 days and the actual observed values for the next 30 days uh, as a comparison. What this shows us is uh, the graph on the left, uh, you know, the R squared value is 0.7, but we have significantly distributed data. What this shows us is that uh, assuming that CPAP usage will be the same or similar one month to the next is not a very effective model. CPAP uses changes a lot. It's highly dynamic. It could even be characterized as not very stable. And as a result, we need more powerful models if we want to be able to, to look into the future. In contrast, the AI algorithm produced an R squared value of 0 0.94, a very high R squared value. And that demonstrates that by taking advantage of the temporal characteristics, the patterns that occur over time in these very large data sets, uh, we can very accurately be able to forecast how many days the patient in this experiment won't use their CPAP next month. 
We repeated this analysis for the number of days above four hours, as you can see here, with an R squared value on the AI, uh, from the AI of 0 0.95 that significantly outperformed a simplistic model that assumed uh, usage would be the same or similar next month. And in the last analysis, uh, observed an AI R squared value of 0 0.87, again, demonstrating a very strong strength of fit uh, with an R squared value on the simple assumption of 0 0.56. Relative to the two prior experiments, we observe the lowest R squared value here, both from the AI as well as from uh, the month to month change. And what that suggests is this particular range of less than four hours is even more dynamic and even more variable on a month over month basis uh, than even the zero or the above four hour level. So this brings it all together, uh, just in a visualization. Um, so in a, prediction, in, a, in a production sense, the algorithm would get 30, uh, the most recent 30 or more days of CPAP data. It reads that data to predict the number of days next month the patient will use their CPAP. Those predictions are broken down into our three-letter rating system. That rating system translates into one of four phenotype groups, and those groups inform and uh, strategically align intervention opportunities with individual patient care in a personalized way. Uh, so that was our regression analysis. The second set of results uh, we'll look at is our classification results for correctly categorizing patients into phenotype groups. In this experiment, we observed a 90% sensitivity for getting the patient into the correct group, 95% specificity for uh, you know, get, keeping the patients out of the wrong groups, 95% accuracy, and a 0 0.83 cones kappa. These results indicate very high classification performance for the algorithm's ability to correctly phenotype patients, as well as, uh, you know, supported by the cones kappa, uh, shows that this is not, you know, highly agreement by chance. This is really based on some meaningful patterns the algorithm is, has learned to identify in that CPAP usage. Lastly, the third analysis uh, for resupply interventions and adherence. Um, we had more than 20 different types of resupply, uh, different types of cushions, masks, filters, et cetera, uh, that we tested. We observed uh, a statistically significant positive effect in several cases. Uh, and for the group of resupply interventions that had statistically significant uh, improvements in usage, we observed an average increase in usage of 7 to 14 percent month over month. Uh, in simple terms, there are multiple resupply interventions that produce a meaningful improvement in patient CPAP usage, and having personalized information to help to select from those options, uh, we believe will be a helpful tool. So, in conclusion, we believe we've defined a new rating system for adherence um, using a, a rope we're using a robust model to predict future adherence based on past CPAP usage we've identified resupply interventions that correlate with an increase in adherence and we hope that this is going to um, help maintain CPAP adherence for clinicians in the future the future work that we're looking at with this project is gonna be using a higher quality and larger potentially prospective data set, improving the AI methodology, as well as the uh, increasing the combination rating and phenotype structure, uh, clinical validation of predictive uh, versus the reactive adherence alerts, seeing does it really help us to, to see in the future, um, and, and if we get that alert and act on it, will we actually impact the patients in advance? Um, reinventing the, the intervention process. So really understanding in these different phenotypes, can we identify specific interventions that bring specific phenotypes to, uh, to uh, you know, medical benefits sooner? And then how do we apply these applications beyond sleep medicine? So I'm gonna pass it back one more time to Chris and let him talk a little bit about what we're doing currently in healthcare with artificial intelligence and in sleep and where that goes next. So 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Billy. Uh, so as we can see here, artificial intelligence is clearly uh, you know, beginning to transform CPAP therapy, but we are really just at the tip of the iceberg. And so we'd like to end with a few of the opportunities that we are the most excited about um, in this realm that we are actively working on today. Uh, we're working with leading health systems to improve on the failure rates of new and alternative therapies uh, that can be considered. Uh, you know, in terms of you know more sophisticated indices, we're working with leading academic medical centers to develop novel diagnostic indices and biomarkers that stand to provide a more holistic view uh, into the patient's health than the simple AI does today and that have an opportunity for a more effective titration. Uh, we've done excellent work with the, the team at Better Night to automatically detect opportunities to fine tune CPAP settings as patient age or weight changes, and even to automatically predict the optimal therapeutic CPAP titration pressure with an opportunity to modulate that over time using AI-based auto titration. Uh, lastly, Part of what motivated us to engage in this work, uh, many may not know this, but, but way back uh, in, in around 2011, Enso Data was actually working on a technology uh, for monitoring congestive heart failure patients at home that sought to reduce CHF readmissions and to predict decompensations before they happened. Uh, our statistical results there were immensely successful, but in the context of deploying that into the real world, that performance really was not the just the solution. The bigger and the more pressing challenge it was really motivating patients to change their behaviors that led to those decompensation situations. And where the rubber meets the road is really in that behavior change process and the way that we approach patient experience. That uh, work on CHF and a lot of other experiences have provided us tremendous motivation and excitement for the application of AI to improve CPAP uh, treatment for patients, but even more pressingly, to, in order to do that, to create tools at the interface of AI and behavior, uh, behavioral medicine and behavior change. Uh, so with that, uh, we have an exciting panel coming up. I'll pass it back to Cindy uh, to introduce uh, our, our new panelists, but we would love to take any questions that you have about this work or any related topic. Uh, so thank you very much for joining and excited to, to get on the mic with everybody soon here. Perfect. Thank you, Chris and, and Billy. Um, so I'm going to introduce our other two entrants to the webinar. Uh, first, we have Dr. Dominic Manafu, who is an MD and FABSM. He's the Chief Medical Officer at Better Night. He brings over 25 years of medical expertise in diagnosing and treating patients with sleep disordered breathing. And as chief medical officer at Better Night, he designed and implemented clinically validated protocols based on his extensive experience and research related to cardiovascular consequences of sleep disordered breathing. And then also from the Enzo data, te data team, we have Yoav Nygate, who's the machine, uh, I'm sorry, machine learning engineer. And Yoav has a master's degree in biomedical engineering from Tel Aviv University in Israel and brings healthcare AI and machine learning experience to our Enzo data team. He also focuses on the research and developments of new approaches to improve the AI algorithms that power Enzo data's products, as well as the research projects with Enzo data's partners and collaborators such as this. So we've already had a bunch of great questions typed in and we're gonna go ahead and get started answering those. Uh, I have one, the, the question that I'll kick off with, and I'm not sure, Chris, if you want to decide who wants to answer these, uh, but in your opinion, um, why do you think there's the most variance in the greater than four hour cohort? I think that would be an excellent question for Billy or Dominic uh, to provide some additional clinical context uh, from their wealth of experience. Yeah, I, I think I can try to tackle that one. So. You know, I mean, we have a lot more to learn about that specific group of patients. You know, the, the predictability for patients that are have already created a, a behavior change and are, are at a successful level, the maintenance level, if you would, of the behavior change is going to look a lot more stable um, in terms of what usage looks like and, and habit-wise. And so, 
that's really where you'll start to see that breakdown. And so when you get under under four hours, you're really seeing the group of patients that are on the fence. They're putting it on, but they're not achieving the success level that they should. And that makes using it harder, which makes whether or not they're going to even put it on or 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 achieve over four hours very uh, uh, unstable. So I think that's the reason why that's so hard to predict. Perfect. Next question uh, actually comes with a comment first. Great classification results. However, do you think the class imbalance of the collected data may have affected classification? Yeah. Yoav, uh, do you have it, would you like to share any insights on uh, kind of the prevalence of the, of the different classes and user groups and uh, how we approach that in our statistical analysis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, regarding the prevalence, um, there's, you know, obviously more, um, you know, the, the bands between the variable users and the no users at all and, you know, the the you know greater than four hour adherence um you could also kind of see this um and that also a little bit connects to the previous question uh, that we had and that might be related to also why the you know greater than four hours um kind of like didn't perform as well as the others um and we haven't there are several many you know like class imbalancing approaches out there and we haven't explored you know um everything that exists and this is some, you know, for sure, some kind of like future work that we can uh, definitely look into. Um, but regarding the exact prevalence, I don't, you know, have the the exact uh, values. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is for sure something that we can definitely look into and control for, and you know, it could potentially improve the results in the future. Agreed. I think that's a that's a great question. And in this particular work, we didn't find the class imbalances to be so severe uh, that we moved to a precision recall uh, style statistical analysis relative to sensitivity and specificity. Uh, but in future work, I think that would be an excellent addition um, to provide even more insight into, into that. Perfect. Another question coming in. Can this approach be used to ID patients that just will not do well with PAP therapy early so we could move on more quickly to other treatment options? So that's Doctor. a very interesting question. Uh, I, I would like to take a, take, make a comment on it. And um, in this work specifically, where we are you know, basing the algorithm on CPAP usage data, um, that would not be as applicable prior to the point that the patient would have a CPAP. And that, that seems to be the point in time where you'd benefit the most from having that knowledge. Um, but what this work represents is the ability to pull out behavioral information from underlying objective data, like waveform data or like CPAP usage data. The behavioral characteristics are not explicitly embedded in the waveforms per se, there may not be a, an event detection equivalent of this, this person, you know, is not necessarily likely to be the most successful candidate on CPAP therapy, uh, but sort of implicitly embedded in that data, uh, specifically EMR data, uh, by looking at historical data in variables like missed appointments, compliance on other medications, and other factors like that, you know, one can also produce behavioral uh, estimates for treatment success factors and then to utilize those at the point of care to help to either select treatments or to uh, help to inform how best to coach those patients, uh, knowing up front that they might, uh, you know, be a little bit more likely to struggle. And, yeah, and, Chris, and, if, I, and if I can add to that, well. oh, sorry, go ahead. This is Dominic. I just was going to reiterate. I think Chris has makes a really great point. Ultimately. If we can start to look at these phenotypes and incorporate data from further upstream, as he mentioned, from their either their behavior, their demographics, their uh, sleep study, and try to find those variables that might correlate with subsequent difficulty, then it would, in fact, help us to stratify people into groups that might best be offered an alternate therapy later or sooner rather than later. 
Yes, and and if I can add to that too, I think you know as we as we look at future work, when I when I talk about um, uh, increasing the rating scale potentials and, and, and the 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 phenotype groups, ideally with a with a pr prospective patient base, um, we could we would like to see what types of intervention and what you know how many interventions so we can predict cost of of bringing patients and predict cost and pathway to bring patients into success or identify, like you said, identify specifically which phenotypes based off of demographics, the amount of work we're doing with them, the type of work we're doing with them, their usage pattern, and the artificial intelligence making the choice that they can't be saved at that point, and then actually getting them, like you said, to uh, alternative therapies faster. I think that that is part of the, the that should be ideally part of the next step with this is is really using it to start to truly identify what we can do with the different groups and and where we can take those groups because we really need to know which groups we can and can't save when we start to talk about all of these follow-up programs we can have the best most robust follow-up program in the world but dme companies don't want to invest in it or staff for it if they don't believe and that they can move patients from poor to successful and they don't understand the cost of moving them from poor to successful. So ideally, yeah, identification for that would be part of the next step as well. I would add one other thing, Billy, uh, when we talk a little bit about the variability and some of the good users, some of that may also turn out to be a little bit of changes and differences in the endotypes. So we've talked a little bit about the phenotypes, we've talked about their behavioral patterns, their characteristics, Ultimately, we may want to try to see if we can also identify uh, changes in behavior based on the endotypes, the disease sort of pathogenic mechanisms. So that's another area of uh, future work, hopefully, that may also help to explain some of the variability in some of the groups. Absolutely. There were quite a few questions in line uh, with with that, so I think we covered a few of those. If you had a question along the lines of identifying which program or which therapy would work better, and we didn't get it covered, go ahead and type that question in again because I don't want to miss it. Um, but another question we got is, outside of resupply, have you looked at what interventions can drive short-term adherence in the first 90 days? So after you're able to try to predict it, have have has anybody on this team looked at interven interventions and, and tracked it? We haven't yet. Um, and this is uh, absolutely part of uh, the future work. Uh, the resupply uh, data that we showed, um, is, that's the, the kind of like the main interventions that we looked at. And we also saw that we, you know, we didn't have, we didn't get like a very, um, uh, impactful effects uh, or correlations, uh, you know, from those uh, types of interventions. And I mean, you know, we we are definitely going to look at, you know, first of all, more data about those, you know, more resupply interventions, but other interventions as well. Kind of like seeing how they affect the different, re you know, compliance uh, categories and phenotypes, and uh, yeah, all of that stuff. So this is absolutely part of the future works of this project. Yeah, and if I if I could speak to you know a little bit the resupply interventions that we looked at, you know, um, this was this 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 was done retrospectively using a a patient database that um, that is that that does have very good access to resupply, and so um, as you see these dips pre resupply when patients start to fall apart. Um, you see these incline, uh, you see this increase, tiny increase after resupply. Um, there's, there's, you know, I think m my big question is, 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 you know, wanting to see this in other patient bases where maybe resupply isn't as accessible. I think that patients across the nation struggle to reach their resupply in a timely fashion, and so seeing it in a patient base that doesn't have that level of access may bring out an even higher impact in positive compliance upon uh, resupply, so. And one last thing to add there is, you know, I think that part of, part of why this is such a great question is it, is it you know, gives us a good example of how uh, different types of interventions or different approaches for intervention, you know, may be most effective 
uh, how that changes over time and how that how that can become different. You know, that first 90 day period is is a critically important period. It's a period to form habits, to build momentum. And as it relates to this work, you know, in the context of an AI system, we'd hypothesize we'd allow a higher frequency of patient behavioral outreach and coaching to initially align those extrinsic and extrinsic motivators uh, effectively uh, at the beginning. Um, and in that period as well, the patient's gonna be more susceptible to well understood uh, sort of behavioral events like the abstinence violation effect uh, as one example. That effect is, is what from some folks informally refer to as the effort effect, uh, the effect where you know when one uh, eats a certain number of Oreos out of a, out of a full pack of Oreos, they're increasingly inclined uh, to not stop there and to, to do the rest. Similarly, you know, if I haven't used my CPAP uh, in two days versus in 10 days, I'm more likely to be able to re restart my usage, you know, the less time that it's been. And so, you know, really, I think focusing in on, on the behavioral, the educational components, uh, especially at the beginning to try to build uh, up that initial usage to, to uh, a desired level and then to sustain that usage uh, over time is, is really the focus going forward. That's fantastic. I think I have the Oreo scenario <laughs> happening in my household between me and my 15-year-old son. All right, guys, if you haven't had a chance to type your question in, please do so now. We have two left. Um, and then if any more come in, we'll get to those. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and start wrapping up. Um, first of the last two for now is finding the proper pressure for patients using auto devices. How could this data apply? Yes, so I would like to, you know, cite some prior work that we've done uh, with the great folks on this call, with the Better Night team, uh, to, to to help to answer that question. Um, so, in the context of an initial uh, CPAP pressure, we worked with the Better Night team to compare, uh, you know, more than 4,000 patients. Uh, we trained an AI algorithm to predict the optimal therapeutic CPAP pressure that was initially prescribed and then later validated. Uh, you know, for, for patients therapy. Um, and in that work, we were able to get within plus or minus two millimeters of H2O with 97% accuracy uh, based on our AI model. So there are already strong indicators uh, that AI can be a very effective tool uh, to further support translating sleep study results into an effective uh, set of parameters and settings for the initial CPAP therapy. But what was really interesting about that work is based on how that AI model was built, um, that application was not specific to that, to that time frame that's post-diagnosis pretreatment. That algorithm can actually be applied in more of an ongoing or a living basis uh, to help to facilitate you know, ongoing auto titration in a way that's cloud connected and in a way that can take advantage of what's being learned from other patients that may be struggling with similar issues out there. And so, you know, we believe uh, those methods in combination uh, with the further advancements that are being made on both phenotypes and indices that tell us more than the AHI uh, presents an exciting opportunity for AI to really uh, build, build upon significantly what we've been able to do, you know, so far as a field in terms of, of best, best setting those, those treatment parameters. Awesome. We did have a couple more questions pop in. So good. That means people are are still, their minds are still thinking about different things that we can do with this research. So the next one is, can you use RNN architecture to predict when, if patients can lower their CPAP pressure over time, provided other lifestyle changes are occurring that can promote the opportunity for needing less help from the therapy? Ooh, that's, a, that's an awesome question. Um, so, yeah, so one thing to keep in mind is, you know, the AI models are as good as the data that they have access for. So it really depends, um, you know, what type of data the AI model can access that, you know, may affect uh, these kind of like uh, decisions. So if there, you know, different kinds of metadata, um, you know, uh, demographics, age, um, you know, weight, uh, everything, or even, you know, other types of disorders, 
um, that can be used to like uh, kind of track and you know make those types of decisions uh, can definitely be made. And you know the 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 overall kind of like advantage of the RNN models is it can ha it has this nice time dependency. So it's extremely well with it, it performs really well with uh, types of data that change over time. So any type of data that is correlated um, to you know those types of pressures and can affect that decision that the model AI model can track over time could absolutely help with uh, this type of uh, problem. Um, so yeah, so that's an, an, an excellent comment. We have a very smart audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question, many patients and DME providers have access to apps such as MyAir, AirView, and USleep. How do we prevent a misalignment in this use case? Um, I don't know. I I don't understand the misalignment. How, how I would think you... I, I could share, you, share a on that. you know, I think one thing that uh, that's really at the core of, of this work and maybe all of research in sleep is sort of the, the, the core concept of interoperability, being able to access data uh, for research applications like this to develop new technology to advance the state of knowledge in the basic science of sleep to utilize those technologies and to translate those technologies you know, into clinical practice so that they can be used by folks. The world is getting more complicated and, and not less complicated. And I think that you know, as a field, moving in the direction of further establishing interoperability, building an ecosystem you know, of, of groups uh, that can be combined to support patient care and being able to plug in applications like AI to existing tools uh, that, that patients utilize to allow those tools to do new things or to encapsulate some of their existing functionalities in a new way uh, is a really important and promising opportunity to uh, achieve a, a, a scale uh, with these, these new AI tools uh, that will make a huge impact on clinical medicine. Awesome, okay, now we're down to the last two. I know everybody's getting ready to, we'll, we'll stick to the hour timeframe for sure. So second to last question, did your team correlate the efficacy, AHI, or leak with the adherence? We did not. Um, yep, we did not try that. Okay. Um, yeah. the, this work was focused on that CPAP usage data, uh, but to Dr. Munafo's earlier point, by incorporating sleep study data and combining that with treatment data and going even further upstream from there, the more data we encapsulate into this ecosystem, the more possibilities and opportunities it creates for the AI to refine and to take on new, new applications as well. And yeah, I think Chris, I, would, too, I, would, I, would, I would just, I would just uh, reiterate that. I think that you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity to, to look at more variables to try and make the model more robust and certainly incorporating uh, information about leak would be uh, something that we might want to use. So I think this is just, this is sort of the first step in trying to um, use AI to try to predict future compliance, but there are a lot of steps yet to be, yet to be uh, accomplished. Yeah, I think if I can add to that too, Dr. Manapa, I think one of the, the, the primary reasons why when I was looking at this and I was uh, talking with Chris, I, I didn't even really want to consider uh, AHI um, or efficacy or leak as much. And the reason why is because of the 14,000 patients that are being used, a lot of this data could be, is potentially coming from, a large portion of it is coming from machines that were S9s and don't report leak in the same way that a lot of the newer machines do. So the machine manufacturing, at least for the last five years, has very much been on our side in terms of creating base level machines that give you everything through modems. But that wasn't so much the case for probably the first uh, five to 6,000 patients of these 14,000. So um, in, in the future, now that we, you know, we'll continue looking at this in the future, definitely AHI um, efficacy and, and leak should play a major role in how patients get phenotyped and classified for work, essentially for intervention, so. 
Perfect. And I think that leads well to the last question that I saved. We had, I know you guys had a slide on this, but we had a couple of variations to, so what's next? Excitement about the research and kind of what the future plans are. So I thought that'd be a good question to save it up as you guys kind of wrap up. What's the next step and what's the future for this research? So, um, Chris, can, should I tackle or, or who, who wants to tackle that? Yeah, Billy, happy. Feel free to tackle that. I'm happy to tackle that as well. Yeah. I, so, you know, I, I this is a really exciting project for me. Um, you know, it, it I, it's great to be able to predict the future of where patients may go with their adherence. Um, ideally, it would be great to find out how much knowing they're going to do poorly and intervening how much does that intervention impact them by by advancing it um, to, to even before the behavior change has occurred that would be really interesting but the real the real meat in in, in the future for this i think is is about a perspective patient base it's about like you like what some of the questions that were asked earlier identifying through note structure specific intervention types, how much intervention, cost of intervention, um, to move patients from specific phenotypes and into the next phenotype uh, where they potentially have more medical benefit. And what does that program look like? It would be ideal if we could eventually build out a cost analysis of what a standard durable medical equipment population should look like. Um, based off of what exists inside of the phenotypes. And then uh, DME companies, you know, could start to really assess cost analysis of building real programs to help them. Um, I, that, you know, beyond that, this could potentially be built into a follow-up program itself that could be used by DMEs to help people. But even before that happens, I think, you know, convincing the DME world that, there is an affordable way and to invest in follow-up for patients and that there is a group of patients specifically that can be coached in a specific manner towards success. I think those are the big things that, that stop DME companies um, nationwide from doing what they should do, which is support patients through the behavior change and help them adapt to CPAP for long-term compliance, so. Yeah, very well said. Billy. And I think, you know, even on a person level, for us individually as patients, I think at the end of the day, we all want to be healthy. And we're excited about the opportunity for tools like this to make it a lot easier for all of us uh, to do that at a fundamental level and to make it easier for the works that work so hard uh, at the, in the front lines of sleep medicine and patient care to make that job easier, make the patients more successful. Another area that we may look to move into also is trying to better elucidate the differences within the groups of variable users and occasional users and try and better define within those groups where each of those individuals is headed. So that would be another future direction. Yeah, and yeah, no, that, that's a great point. Um, yeah, and from more of an AI machine learning perspective, you know, like, like it's been already mentioned previously, you know, looking at more data, more diverse data, you know, the sleep staging of the patients, uh, the pressures, the leaks, the AHI, you know, all of, you know, demographics, age, every single, you know, other information that we can plug into our, our AI models that will help, you know, the overall performance of the AI models would be definitely interesting, uh, you know, to experiment with. And you know, like uh, like has you know has been mentioned as well. You know, we basically right now we categorized four phenotypes. Um, you know, the good users, variable users, occasional users, and no users. It will be definitely you know interesting to find other phenotypes, other categories, different splits of the categories that could definitely affect uh, the overall intervention intervention process and uh, also the accuracies of the AI model. You know, because the more the phenotypes are more accurate uh, with you know, actual reality, the better the AI model will be able to perform. Um, so yeah, that's also another view. Yeah, and as the AI model grows on its own, it can help us, it can help create the phenotypes that are identified through, um, through what we can feed into it, especially if we can back feed in notes and that identify um, the types of interventions that led to impact and all of that. So it, it's really exciting, so. Well said, everybody. Okay, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. 
Have a great day. Thanks again. Take care.